Hello everyone. In this video, I will show the plot of the game Tactics Ogre. Let us cling together. This game is the direct sequel to Ogre Battle, the March of the Black Queen, and takes place in the same time period as Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber. A lot is officially vague and left to interpretation, so I made the script more simplified and chronologically for understanding. In this video, I will be using information from the neutral route and the Lord ending. If you like the Ogre Battle Saga, subscribe to the channel and like the video for YouTube to show this amazing universe to more people around the world. Ready? Let's go! At the beginning of everything, the creation. According to legends, in the beginning a superior God created all things. He became known as Great Father Philaha and created various races, environments, climates and three main realms. The realm of the heavens, where Philaha and her sacred servants would live like angels and lesser gods, such as the elemental goddesses. Below them would live some creatures and humans, preferred creation and made in the likeness of the superior god in the earth realm. And finally, below them, the underworld, a land inhabited by chaotic and very powerful creatures like ogres and also home to evil gods. What would allow the connection and movement between these three realms would be the so-called Chaos Gates, magical portals distributed around the realms. In this scenario, humans thrived across the land, developing and creating kingdoms. All was going well until at one point, Demunza, the god of the underworld and darkness, decides to send 108 legions of ogres to the surface through the chaos gates in order to rule the land for himself. His army of monsters and demons was far more powerful than humans, equaling even the gods due to the help of the dark powers and the innate violence of the species. This gave even more advantage to the cursed army, which advanced through the regions easily, destroying everything and everyone. One of the races that fought alongside the ogres are called Dragon Lords, powerful creatures that used draconic magic and were holders of a lot of knowledge. They left their knowledge in ruins and preferred to settle near Chaos Gates to steady its power. Deadless was one of these dragon lords who built a huge shrine in honor of Asmodee, one of the evil gods of the underworld. This shrine was located on an island to the south called Valyria, above a chaos gate and was called the Palace of the Dead, as it lured bitter spirits into the abyss. The extinction of humans and domination by the underworld was a matter of time. But to protect humans, the gods above decide to intervene. In the last battle for the human race, an army of angels is sent from the heavens to the battlefield, along with three legendary knights from ages past and twelve mighty sages with divine powers. Furthermore, one of the lesser gods identified on a continent far south of the battlefield some exceptional humans called Balmakins. Admired by their strength and ferocity in battle, this god used their powers to bring them to the battlefield as reinforcements against the ogres. And so would begin the war of the last humans and divine beings against the legions of ogres. This event became known as the Ogre Battle.
After long and difficult battles, humans allied to the powers of divine armies managed to defeat a large number of monsters, sending them back to the underworld and sealing the chaos gates to prevent further invasions. However, a seer had made a premonition that another ogre battle would occur sometime in the future. With that in mind, before returning to the skies again, one of the legendary knights who helped in the battle leaves the humans with his sword called Brynhild, which is capable of breaking any seal. So, when the time comes, humans could use it to reopen a chaos gate and again call for help from the heavens for the ultimate battle. With the threat of the ogres defeated, humans could now develop and expand to various parts of the world again. Many years later, Dorgalua's Great War. A lot of time passes and humans know prosperity, creating multiple kingdoms around the world again. Our focus here will be on the Valyrian Isles, a strategic and commercial point, which due to this ends up being frequently attacked by pirates and barbarians who dispute control of the region with the inhabitants. The island is home to three distinct ethnic groups that ended up being organized into five main kingdoms. The Bakram are the lineage of nobles, aristocrats, and religious, living to the north of the island in the kingdom of Fittic and kingdom of Barnisha. In these regions is the Order of Philaha, an organization that worships the great father Philaha, his elemental daughters, and his heavenly servants. This religion is widespread throughout the island and therefore had a lot of influence. The Galgastani, the majority of the population, making up 70% of all people on the island, lay to the south in the kingdom of Brigantes and kingdom of Coritania. Also to the south were the Wallisters, the minority who were discriminated against by the Bakram and the Galgastani, and occupied the kingdom of Almorica. The kingdom of Brigantes was ruled by King Roger Dismoria. The kingdom of Coritania commanded by Count Orlando. The kingdom of Fittuk ruled by King Rianica. The kingdom of Barnisha commanded by Lord Clement and the kingdom of Almorica was commanded probably by some duke of the region. These kingdoms lived in disputes seeking to expand their domains, but they were always small and punctual conflicts. Brigantes, however, secretly financed rebels in Barnisha to overthrow and destabilize the kingdom. The leader of these rebels was called Dorgalua Abarith. Everything changed when these rebels against Lord Clement of Barnisha tried to stage a coup to seize power. The coup is foiled, but Lord Clement is killed in the process. King Ramonica of Fittuk hears about the Lord's death and decides to take advantage of the chaos that has been raging in the kingdom to start his domination project. The King of Fittuk then declares war on the kingdoms of Barnisha and Almorica and begins his attack. Not satisfied with attacking just the two of them and wanting the island all to himself, King Ramonica orders his troops to invade the kingdom of Coritania as well, where they manage to kill Count Orlando. With Orlando dead and seeing Fittica's advance and imminent threat, King Roderick of Brigantes takes control of the region of Coritania and leads Coritania and her kingdom of Brigantes, now united as one, to enter the war against King Ramonica. Dorgalua and his rebels also sense the threat and team up with Roderick to defeat Ramonica. The two powerful battlefronts manage to advance against Fittica's armies and reach King Ramonica, ending him and his bloodthirsty war. 
To avoid more massive conflicts like this and more deaths, Roderick and Dorgalua decide to make a non-aggression agreement between them. This attitude brought only a few months of peace to the island, as both felt harmed by the terms of the agreement. And again, the plains of Valeria were stained with blood as the two armies collided for what felt like eternity. Desperate with the never-ending battle, King Roger Dismoria decides to perform an act of insanity. He uses the secret knowledge hidden in his kingdom and passed down from generation to generation to summon the ultimate forbidden spell, the Apocrypha. The invocation makes the whole earth tremble, rocks break loose towards the abyss and hellfire. Furious winds cut the soldiers as they passed, agitated rays ran across the battlefield, burning everything and everyone along with fireballs hotter than the sun itself. The absolute ice hit the soldiers' armor. Beams of light coming directly from the sky hit people, evaporating them, and those who tried to flee were swallowed by abyssal spirits summoned from the darkness itself. Roderick had made the ultimate sacrifice. The powerful effects of the magic destroyed a large chunk of Dorgalua's army, but along with them also several soldiers from Roderick's own army, and even civilians in nearby villages, were obliterated along the way. Such an attitude turned Roderick's army against the king himself, and this internal instability was enough for Dorgalua to advance and win the war. Roderick was arrested and died in his cell in agony. His bitter soul was drawn to the palace of the dead on the island and sealed away in the abyss by the chaos gate there. The war had come to an end. Dorgalua makes alliances and encourages the miscegenation of the nation, unifying all the island kingdoms under one. From now on he would be known as the Dynast King of the Kingdom of Valyria, the one who fought the war to end all wars, bringing peace and unity to Bakrams, Galgastanis, and Wallisters. While these events were taking place on the islands, in the western region of the continent of Galius, the Holy Lodician Empire was born. This empire was based on the religious dogma of Lodicism, which preached that there was only one supreme god, named Filler, and that any other supposed gods worshipped in other religions around the world would be nothing more than avatars of Filler. So the worship of these avatars is blasphemous and should be fought. Only true faith should exist. Initially, this dogma was restricted only to the region where the empire was located. But it didn't take long for the king to decide to expand this doctrine to other people and gain more power. This campaign would become known as the Holy War and was initially supported by the clergy as a way of expanding the religion and by nobles and merchants as a way of acquiring wealth. Later, the participating knightly orders themselves began to support it as a form of ordeal of pride and honor. Lodi's army was made up of 16 legions of mighty knights. With the strength of his armies, Lodi's commits his crusades to the nearby regions in order to force the conversion to his religion and also exercising dominion and control, either directly, as if they were his colonies, or indirectly, giving certain autonomy to those who surrender but controlling the most important decisions of the kingdoms. The empire was controlled by a king, but Pope Sardian makes a violent coup d'etat together with the Senate and becomes the supreme ruler of the empire, ordering beyond the domination of lands, the search for magical and mythological artifacts to further expand his power and influence. Southeast of the continent of Galius was the continent of Zydegenia. 
To defend against a possible invasion of Lodis, the sacred Zydegenian Empire is formed, led by Empress Endora and Sage Rashidi. Rashidi ends up coming into contact with magic from the abyss and corrupting the entire kingdom with darkness and leading the entire population to oppression. The history of this region is told in detail in the game The March of the Black Queen. I will leave the video above for you to watch. The sacred Zydegenian Empire has been in place for approximately 25 years, and in between that time, an event involving some angels occurs on Ovis, an island located northwest of Galius. This event is detailed in the game The Night of Lodis, which I'll also leave on the card above for you to follow along. This event ends up leading a knight to meet the Pope and present him with a divine relic. As a reward, Sardian renames the knight to Lancelot Tartarus and makes him leader of one of the 16 legions, called the Dark Knights Lothlorien, the strongest among the 16, formed by a few elite knights, to carry out secret missions such as espionage and assassinations, being the right arm and private security of the Pope himself. The Dark Knights are respected in Lodis as well as feared in other regions. Afraid that all this trust the Pope had placed in Tartarus and the Dark Knights could lead to a coup by them to come to power, Vogers v. Roms, a man of great influence in Lodis and commander of several orders of knights, decides to infiltrate his two sons, Hogarim v. Roms and Balxaphon v. Roms, in the group to spy. Tartarus, as a very manipulative man, discovers the plan and Balxaphon ends up being swayed to change sides. When Vogers refuses to support the Lothlorien, Balxaphon kills his father and accuses his brother of the murder. Hogarim has his eyes gouged out and he is exiled from Lodis as punishment, swearing revenge on his brother for the event. After a few years, the sacred Zydegenian Empire is defeated, and Dora and Rashidi are killed by the Liberation Army under the command of Destin Faroda and Prince Tristan Zenobia. Tristan becomes king and in place of the Empire creates the Kingdom of New Zenobia. Upon learning of Lodi's advances, Destin and four other rebellion warriors head north to investigate, arriving at a kingdom called Palatinus that had already been invaded by Lodis. This adventure is told in the game, Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber, which I'll leave on a card above for you to see later. Back to the Valyrian Islands. To commemorate his victory in the Unified Kingdom, King Dorgalua orders the construction of the Hanging Gardens, a huge tower in the middle of the desert with more vegetation at each floor, as a gesture of love to his wife, Vernada Eltina Aberith. The construction site was a Dragon Lord's Ruin, and also a Chaos Gate. Dorgalua spent a lot of time in these gardens drinking, celebrating with the soldiers, and also accompanied by women. And it was in one of these moments that he had an affair with the most faithful servant of Queen Vernada, named Manaflora Bafanda. This relationship ended in Manaflora's pregnancy, which was discovered by the Queen near the time of birth. The queen was furious and ordered her servant to leave. Manaflora leaves alone on a rainy night, but is discovered by Brenton Morn and her brother, Prancet Morn. Both were bishops of the order of Philaha and helped her to give birth. Manaflora names the child Versalia Aberith and then dies. 
Renton tells Prancet to raise the child as his own and keep the secret from the king. Prancet had recently lost his daughter named Cashua, so he would raise this child as if she were Cashua. Brenton is a character who seeks power at any cost, so he uses this information of this child's existence to blackmail Queen Vernada. With this, he is placed in a prestigious position within the Order of Philahab by the Queen's influence. Prancet Morn takes care of Cashua, and three years later he has a son with his wife. The child is called Dana Morn. Prancet was also a close friend of Arcurius Muvafoina, the top rank of the Order of Philaha. Muva had four daughters, named Seria, Sherry, Sistina, and Olivia. The six children always played together outside the sanctuary while their parents attended to the Order's obligations. King Dorgalua receives the scrolls containing the apocrypha spells used by Roderick in the war and orders Muva to seal them away so they will never be used again. Muva seals the powerful spells in specific temples around the island with the help of his four daughters, who would act as seal keys if one day someone worthy of having such power arises. Much later, Queen Vernada becomes pregnant by King Dorgalua, who was very old. The prince is born, the official heir to the throne of Valeria, to the relief of the entire population of the island. The queen had lied to the king that her servant had died in an accident, so Dorgalua was unaware of her daughter's existence. One day, as a child, the prince was playing in the hanging gardens and ended up falling from one of the floors. His parents find the child lifeless and are devastated. A few days pass and Queen Vernada also passes away due to the anguish of her son's death. King Dorgalua begs the heavens for his family to be reincarnated, but his request is not granted. If the light did not answer him, enraged, Dorgalua decides to turn to darkness. He decides to go to the chaos gate that is in the hanging gardens, open the seal with his royal blood, descend to the abyss to become powerful so he can recover his family. However, as soon as he enters, the Chaos Gate would close soon after, so he tells the plan to his most faithful servant who would be in charge of reopening the gate right away so he could return. This information ends up being overheard by some castle employee and ends up reaching Branton's ears. He then decides to act and hires an assassin to kill Dorgalua's servant. The king goes to the Chaos Gate and with his blood opens the portal and emerges into the abyss. The portal closes soon after and with no one to reopen it, Dorgalua is trapped in the underworld. With the death of the heir to the throne and the queen and the disappearance of the king, the kingdom of Valyria descends into chaos and panic. Bakrams, Galgastani and Wallisters fight again. Branton takes advantage of the situation to use his influence among the backroom and his political power within the Order of Philaha and expels Mruva, becoming the supreme leader of the Order, determining the independence of the North and the creation of the backroom Valyria Kingdom. As the royal family was not available to rule, he finds a distant relative of the queen who was still a child and becomes regent of the kingdom until the child grows up, giving the orders and having all the control. 
Brenton begins to have nightmares in which Dorgalua orders him to be released from his prison. To the south, the Galgastani organize themselves and form the kingdom of Galgastan under the rule of Hierohant, Lunderbal Batos. Bal Batos is also an authoritarian dictator with a thirst for power, so to legitimize his authority he takes the son of the former Count Orlando and becomes regent of the country until the child grows up, just like Branton. Also to the south, the Wallister territories are organized under the regency of Duke, Judah Ramwe, a versatile politician and good strategist who convinces the masses to support him in command. Seeing his brother's lust for power and fearing that he would someday come after Versalia, Prancer decides to flee south with his children. He goes to the city of Galiat, decides to become a Wallister, and changes everyone's family name to that of his wife, Pavel, in order to hide. The two children befriend a boy named Vice Bozek in the area and soon become great friends. The three new centers of power were formed on the island, but seeing the numerical superiority of the kingdom of Galgaston, Branton knew it was a matter of time before they were invaded and dominated, so he made a decision. He contacts the Holy Lodician Empire and proposes a deal. They would help his kingdom with the soldiers of Lodis and in return he talks about the lost daughter of the last king and especially about the power Dorgalua went to obtain in the Abyss. Lodis becomes interested in obtaining this power and entrusts the Dark Knights with this mission in secret. Knowing that it was a sealed Chaos Gate, Commander Lancelot Tartarus decides to go to Zenobia in search of the sword capable of breaking any seal that was one of the sacred treasures of the royal family. He prepares his battalion consisting of Knights of Lodis and the elite Knights Balxafon v. Roms. Volok Winzelf, Martim Numus, Barbus Dodgues, Osmo Glacius, Osmamo Glacius, and Endora's Gaffron for this mission. They reach Zenobia and are eventually discovered, causing a fight between the Dark Knights and King Tristan's Holy Knights. Tartarus loses an eye during the battle, but they managed to steal the sword Brynhild and set out for the Valyrian Islands. King Tristan decides to send his best warriors in search of the sword in secret. Under the exile claim, he sends the knight Lancelot Hamilton along with Canopus Wolf, Warren Omen, Merton Walhorn, and Gildas Burn towards the Valyrian Islands. From Zenobia, another character decides to go to the islands as well. It was Deneb Rove, a witch who was looking for more knowledge and ways to earn money. Not understanding the reason for her brother's exile, Iuria Wolf also travels to the islands to the west seeking explanations. During the trip she is attacked by pirates. About to be captured, a sea witch appears and kills all the bandits. This creature feeds on people's souls, so it decides to possess Ayuria's body and use her beautiful voice to attract even more souls to be devoured, staying in a cave in the south of the island. Hoberum discovers that the Dark Knights have gone to Valyria, and even though he is now blind, he heads towards the island to seek revenge on his brother.
Tartarus and his knights arrive on the islands and provide the necessary reinforcement for the backroom. Brenton decides to use his now enhanced army to invade the south and take control of the entire island, but Tartarus stops him saying they are there under Lodi's orders, not Brenton's. Tartarus informs his subordinates that to open the seal of the Chaos Gate, they would need the blood of the royal family, so they should secretly search for the former king's daughter while on the island. While Brenton's thirst for domination was in check, the same could not be said for Balbatos to the south. He inflates the masses by saying that the Galvestanin were a superior race, and their Wallister neighbors an inferior race that should be subjugated. Balbatos then declares the Blood War in order to cleanse the race from the island, invading with his armies the Wallister territory. Duke Ronway is imprisoned in his castle, several Wallisters are killed and a part of these are sent to concentration camps and forced to work. Some Galvestanin are against Balbatos and his attitudes, but as a dictator he punishes anyone who disagrees with his orders, even if they are from the same kingdom. The kingdom of Galgaston now controls the entire south of the island. With Mruva removed from the order due to Brenton's desire for power, the four daughters of the former Archerius take different positions. Olivia remains in the order. Syria founds the rebel group called the Valyrian Liberation Front along with other defectors, such as her sister Sistina, against the Bakram Valyrian Kingdom and established their secret HQ to the east. The last sister, Sherry, decides to betray her father and her sisters and joins Branton, becoming one of her most loyal warriors. Brenton explains to Tartarus about Dorgalua's daughter and that if he found her brother, he would also find the child. Tartarus sought to find the child to place him on the throne as a puppet of Lodi's, taking ultimate control of the island. They end up receiving information that Prancet is in a city called Galiat to the south. So Tartarus gathers all the Dark Knights and prepares an overnight invasion of the city in secret from the backroom. It is precisely here, in this context, that the game will begin. Eighteen years later, let us cling together. Lancelot Tartarus and the other Dark Knights arrive at Galiad. <coughs> to cover their tracks and their real objective, they decide to kill all the people in town and burn all the houses while searching for Prancet and blaming the rebels of the Valyrian Liberation Front. Civilians are awakened in the midst of the massacre and are exterminated one by one. Danum, Vice, and Kashua, who were nearby, hear the screams of people and the torches burning and run back to the city. On the way, they see Vice's father killed by one of the Dark Knights. They reach Prancet and he tells Danum and Kashua to hide. Prancet is taken away by the Dark Knights and the three friends are left desolate within the devastated city. With no information on Prancet's whereabouts, they consider him dead and decide on a revenge plan against Lancelot and his knights. Prancet would be taken north, where he would be interrogated and tortured to tell the whereabouts of Versalia. A month after the Galiad massacre, Danum, Cashua, and Vice set a trap for when Lancelot shows up again at their house. 
They hear footsteps nearby and decide to attack the invaders. His attack is stopped by Commander Lancelot, but it was not Tartarus, but Lancelot Hamilton and the other Zenobians who had arrived on the island. They decide to put down their weapons and talk, as it was a misunderstanding. The Zenobians lied to the three that they were exiles and were there looking for a job. Danum explains that his people, the Wallisters, were dominated by the Galvestanin and their duke trapped in the castle itself. To seek revenge against the Dark Knights, they would need the Duke's help, so the Zenobians decide to help the three invade the castle and free the Duke as a possible job opportunity. Cashua worries about going to war and losing her brother, who at the time was all she had. Denim says that they need to do this and that he would never leave her. They march towards Almorica and encounter resistance from the Galbistanan army that guarded the castle. The incredible strength of Zenobia's warriors manages to defeat the warriors that were there and finally Duke Ronway was free. Ronway says they need to form a military force to reclaim their land, save their people and defeat the bloodthirsty Balbatos. Wallister resistance is founded with some Wallister warriors. The Zenobians are invited to join the group along with the three heroes. Danum, Vice, and Cashua's first mission would be to head west to find Leonar Ressi Ryman, the Duke's right hand knight, who had been hunting a powerful necromancer along with his group and hadn't sent word since. The Zenobians would stay in the castle to protect from another invasion, so it was up to Ravnus Loxarian, a powerful warrior of the Wallister army, to accompany them. On the way they meet some Galgastanan warriors and Canopus appears to help and join them as he was bored in the castle with the others. Arriving at their proposed destination, they encounter one of Leonar's group members named Don Alto Presence, an exorcist who was facing powerful creatures of darkness and was about to be killed. They help in the battle and manage to emerge victorious. Presence takes them to where Leonar was taking refuge. They had underestimated their enemy and their group was all defeated with the exception of Leonar, Presence and two other warriors, the Knight Voltaire Montrose and the Archer Sarah Ostwald. Danum tells them to return to the Duke but Leonar says he's going to finish off the necromancer first for what he's done. Everyone joins the group and goes after him. They finally find him in the middle of a fortress. The necromancer is called Nibeth Abdelord, a Galvestani obsessed with his quest for immortality and who uses his victims' bodies and souls to conjure creatures of darkness at his command. With Danum's help, Leonar manages to advance against the cursed creatures and attack Nibeth, who transforms into a crow and flees the battlefield to continue her experiments. With that threat temporarily defeated, Danum and Leonar's group return to Almorica and report back to the Duke. Now with his most loyal knight at his side again, Ronway intends to declare war on Balbatos and the Kingdom of Galgaston. But he is concerned that Lodis could interfere in the conflict, which would lead to defeat if it were necessary to fight on two fronts. Ronway then orders Danum and his group to head north along with Leonar to fit a castle where the Knights of Lodis were in order to forge an agreement for them not to interfere in the conflict that would take place in the south between Wallister and Galbistani. 
Denim, Cashua, and Vice are apprehensive of making a deal with those they have sworn revenge on, but decide to follow the Duke's orders for the greater good and they head north. On the way to the castle, they encounter some Galvestanian warriors facing a woman. They save her and she introduces herself as Sistina from the Valyrian Liberation Front. Leonar becomes hostile as it is said on the streets that they are violent rebels. Sistina says this is false as they were only seeking peace and were against Brenton's authoritarian rule. Sistina leaves and they continue their journey. They arrive at the castle and are greeted by the Dark Knight Balxaphon, the second in command. Quickly, Tartarus appears and decides to listen to them. Danum, Cashua, and Vice are enraged, seeing their tormentor in front of them. Tartarus realizes that they were survivors of Goliat and apologizes, saying that the information that there were rebels in the city was false. Leonar speaks on behalf of the Duke and comments on the pact. Tartarus agrees and says that Lodis will be neutral in this conflict. Mission accomplished, the heroes return to Almorica to report. Romway says that Galvestan and troops would soon be organized to invade Elmorica again, so the next mission would be to go to the distant town of Balbamusa, which had been turned into a concentration camp where 5,000 Wallisters were being held under forced labor in order to convince them to rebel and face their captors. That way, Balbatos would need to worry about revolts in his own territory before attacking another territory. Due to the difficulty of the mission, Leonar and Ravnus would accompany Danum and his group as a support. Before leaving, Danum meets with Lance Hamilton and they talk about the terror of being on a battlefield. Lance encourages the boy and Danum sets out to fulfill his mission. On the way, they end up encountering a bandit named Gant Vokstein and his two pet beasts, Berta and Abda. They face each other and Gant runs away at the sight of his opponent's strength. They eventually reach the city of Balbamusa and a violent war is waged against the prison guards. The Wallister resistance emerges victorious from the confrontation and manages to reach the prisoners. Danum tries to convince them to revolt and fight, but the prisoners refuse as they can't take any more violence in their lives. Vice is revolted by the lack of apprehension for freedom and the passivity of preferring to live a prisoner's life than taking up arms and fighting for their people against tyranny. Unsuccessful with the convincing, Leonar calls Danum out of the refuge to talk privately. Leonar explains that the Duke already expected that the prisoners would refuse to revolt, so he had planned a plan B. In order to unite all the Wallisters on the island to take up arms, they should kill all the prisoners on Balbamusa and place the blame on the Galvestanin. That way there would be a social upheaval against Balbatos inside and outside his territory. Danum is completely shocked that the Duke would be capable of such a perverse plan to gain support and power and refuses to do so. Vice joins Leonar in supporting the massacre for the greater good. 
To show that he is fully committed to the plan and fully loyal to the Duke, he kills Ravnus who was trying to stop them. Vice and Leonar begin the massacre against the civilians along with their troop who were disguised as Galgastan and soldiers. Danum and Kashua try to stop it by facing some of the soldiers, but it is useless. The massacre takes place and many of your own people's lives are taken in the name of the resistance. News of the Balbamusa massacre spreads across the island. The Wallisters of the island joined the Duke and his resistance, as well as the Galbistanans who were against what happened revolt, creating an internal rift in the kingdom between those who supported Balbatos and those who were against him, even though Balbatos claimed that not have caused the incident. Ramway formally accuses Danum and his group of being traitors and responsible for the massacre, so they are forced to flee and hide in a harbor on the west of the island. Canopus shows that the Duke has placed a bounty on Danum and his group and suggests they meet lands for guidance on what to do. Cashua tells Danum that they should flee the island and seek peace somewhere else, that she couldn't take so much violence and wars anymore. Her brother says they can't stop now, they need to move on and take down the Duke. Heading to the rendezvous with Lands, they find Aracel Dania. Aracel was one of the only survivors of the Balbamusa massacre and is seeking revenge on Danum for the death of her family in the event. Danum tries to explain that he is innocent and that the real culprit was the Duke, but this has little effect and they end up having to fight. Aracel is defeated and retreats. Another Wallister warrior confronts Danum's group on the way. It was Zapan Eludas, a bounty hunter who was after the bounty for their capture. Zapan is defeated and also retreats. They encounter Aracel again, being cornered by Galgastani warriors. Danum and his group defeat the opponents and save the archer. Aracel decides to join the group to see if Danum's innocence in the massacre was true. They arrive at the destination where lands will be waiting for them, but are surprised by Vice's appearance. Vice says that Lands and the other Zenobians had been sent to Rhyme and that the Duke had given orders to kill everyone who had any involvement with the Balbamusa massacre to cover the Duke's tracks. Danum and Vice face off and the protagonist gains the upper hand, causing Vice to retreat. They hear the march of Wallister resistance troops in the distance, indicating that the invasion of the Kingdom of Galgaston will begin soon. They decide to flee to Crisaro to avoid getting caught in the crossfire. On Crisaro, they find some Wallister warriors with a prisoner and decide to help him. They defeat the enemy army and rescue the knight named Falkert Rita Lind. Falkert introduces himself as a warrior from the Valyrian Liberation Front and thanks him. Danum comments that he has no way of getting to Rhyme without going through the war between the two armies, so Falkert comments that the rebel ship had been taken over by pirates, and that if Danum helps retrieve it they would take him to Rhyme by the sea. Danum and Kashua accept the deal and they head towards the pirates. Danum's group confronts the pirates, causing them to retreat, saving another Liberation Front member who was held hostage, the mage Bayan Rosen Orn.
In possession of the ship, Falker decides to fulfill the deal, but Bayon says that the pirates had taken Sistina when they fled. Denham remembers the woman having already helped them once and decides to help them again, despite Cashua being strongly against it for not wanting any further involvement in the war. Defeating the rest of the pirates, Sistina is found and freed. Sistina thanks for the help and says that Danum's group, before being taken to Rhyme, should meet with their leader because there was something they should know. Unable to refuse, they head towards the rebels' hideout. They arrive at the fort and Sistina introduces her sister Saria as the leader of the rebels and asks Danum to help change her mind about the plan Saria intended. Saria's plan was to assassinate the Duke Ronway at this point as the Wallister troops were clashing with the Galbistani troop which would likely lead Brenton to decide to invade the south and take control of the entire island. With Brenton in power, the Liberation Front would assassinate Brenton and take control of the island for themselves. Sistina points out that it was a suicidal plan with many variables that could go wrong and refuses to follow her sister. Danum invites Sistina to join him in seeking peace for everyone on the island. Sistina joins the group along with Falkert and Bane and they sail together to rhyme as promised. At this time, Wallister armies along with Galvestani deserters had managed to advance on Koratani Keep and Balbatos had been arrested and would be executed by the Duke on the spot, marking the end of the Kingdom of Galgaston. Brenton, who was on the royal city of Heim, learns of this and decides to take advantage of this situation to invade the south. He summons the Dark Knights Barbus and Martim and orders them to invade the south. Although Tartarus had made a pact with the Duke to maintain neutrality in the conflict, Barbus and Martim ignore their commander's order and decide to advance south alone with the troops not on Brenton's order but because they heard the Zenobians were there and they wanted a good fight. Denim and his group arrive at Rhyme City and search for lands, but are found first by Zapan again who challenges them to combat. As Zapan was about to be defeated, Danum became distracted by the sounds and torches of the Knights of Lodis who had arrived in the city and began another massacre. Barbus begins attacking civilians and is soon challenged by Lance Hamilton's sword. Zapan takes advantage of the distraction and kidnaps Cashua, saying that they will be at Almorica Castle if he wants to save her. Danum tries to stop Zapan, but Martim appears in front of him, ready to kill. Martim's sword is stopped by the Zenobian sword Gildas, who begins to fight the Dark Knight while Danum flees. Merton and Warren, who were also in the city, face Morlodi's knights and some Brockham troops trying to advance. Warren is seriously injured and Lance tells them to run away while he holds off the enemies. Gildas is defeated and killed by Martim. Warren and Merton retreat and the outnumbered lands is defeated by Barbus. With no more Zenobians around, Barbus and Martim push back Lodi's troops, leading lands to be imprisoned in Heim. While the siege of Rhyme is taking place, Danum heads to Almorica to save his sister. He finds Zapan and fights him, defeating him a third time. 
Zapan retreats into the castle and informs Vice that they will be arriving there soon. Vice is furious at Zapan's incompetence and kills him. Denim arrives at the scene and Vice says that now he can finally kill him. The two face each other again. The clash of former friends, torn apart by a tyrant's lust for power. They are interrupted by Leonor, who informs them that the backroom had managed to subdue Rhyme and were marching towards Almorica. With this great threat now in sight, Leonor asks Danum to reconsider his position and return to the resistance to fight the backroom. Danum realizes the danger in which they would be slaughtered with their invasion, so he decides to accept Leonar's request and returns to the resistance. Many soldiers who accompanied Danum are surprised by this change in their leader's posture as they fought the Duke on his behalf, but decide to continue following his orders. Vice is completely mad at Danum's decision and decides to abandon the resistance, fleeing the castle. Leonard and Danum with their troops head towards the backroom army, and they face each other on the battlefield. While this battle was taking place, Nibeth arrives at Rhyme and sees all the bodies of the people killed in the massacre. He uses his necromantic powers to revive them and, commanding this army of the undead, heads west. Danum and Leonar manage to draw even with the backroom army, preventing the Almorica invasion as the two armies retreat to regroup. Brantum intends to order another attack on Almorica, but Tartharus says that such an attack would be too unwise right now. Brantum grows impatient but decides to heed the advice. In the midst of this, the Liberation Front secretly invades Heim and manages to save Prancet taking him to their headquarters. Barbus and Martin are cursed by Balxaphon for their insubordination in invading Rhyme alone, and Tartarus sends the Dark Knights Oz and Ozma to retrieve Prancet and destroy the Liberation Front. Dana meets the Duke again and he orders Vice to be hunted down as he has disappeared and is someone very dangerous. Danum accepts the mission, but Cashua refuses to hunt down his old friend and abandons the group. Leaving Almorica, they encounter Galvestani rebels commanded by Hector Dodaro, a knight very loyal to his nation, determined to invade the castle. They fight and the rebels are defeated and killed in combat. Danum is informed that Dark Knights have been seen heading towards the Liberation Front, so he decides to go there to help them. Danum and his group arrive too late. The entire Liberation Front had been wiped out and Ozma was leaving with Prancet. Oz stays to face Danum while his sister runs away. Oz proves to be a formidable opponent, but in the end he is defeated and killed in battle. They search the fortress and find Saria very weak but still alive. Saria says that Danum's father, Prancet, is alive and was taken by Ozma. Danum asks Saria to join his group, but she refuses as he is at the behest of the bloodthirsty Duke. Danum decides to return to Almorica to inform his sister that their father is alive. Cashua argues with Danum about him thinking only of war and others and not caring about his own sister. Cashua decides to abandon Danum and leaves alone back to her hometown.
Denim warns the Duke that he hasn't found Vice and is scolded for killing a Dark Knight, which could cause a conflict with Lodis. Romwe sends a formal apology to Tartarus and sends Danum to the port to the west, where several soldiers had been mysteriously killed, most likely by Galgastani rebels. The Duke also informs him that the Zenobium Gildas had been seen at the scene, raising the protagonist's hopes of finding him well. The protagonist goes towards the goal, being intercepted on the way again by Gant and his two beasts. Being unable to face the protagonist again, Gant flees again. Danum also finds Leonar on the way, who was helping some warriors against rebels. They defeat the rebels and the four surviving warriors join Danum's group. They are Chamo Zalman, Festa Morandi, Tammuz Fedorenko, and Hober and Rams. M. Fiddick, Tartarus tortures Prancet with poison. Prancet relents and tells him that Cashua is Versalia, the bastard daughter of King Dorgalua, and that this could be seen in the necklace she wore, a gift from the king to his wife if the child she had was a girl. Tartarus decides to return to Galiad in search of her. They finally arrive at the port and find the person responsible for the attacks. It was Nibeth with his undead army, including the revived Zenobian Gildas, attacking the city. Danum sees two figures in the middle of the attack and decides to help them. They fight the cursed army raised by Nibeth at great cost, but manage to make them retreat. They save the two characters who are Elias Abdelord and Devold Abdelord. Nibeth is their father and they have rebelled against him. Devold had been killed by Balbatos and his father used necromancy to resurrect him. Now they want revenge for that. They indicate where Nibeth was heading and they join Danum's group. On the way, they encounter Cassandra Abdelord, Nibeth's wife, who confronts them. They fight and Cassandra is defeated and killed. Then they face Cressida Abdelord, another daughter of Nibeth. Cressida is defeated and killed. Finally, they reach Nibeth and the undead army. After a very difficult battle, they manage to advance and corner the necromancer, who transforms once again into a crow and flees from there. With that, and with no information on Vice's whereabouts, they return to Almorica. In Galiet, Cashua is sad to be alone. At that moment, Tartarus finds her and tells her that she has always been alone, as she is the last daughter of King Dorgalua. Cashua doesn't believe it, but the knight tells her to look at the necklace she was wearing, which contained the phrases that proved it. She is Versalia, the rightful heir to the kingdom of Valyria. Tartarus tells her to go to Heim with him, because there, Prancid could explain everything. Tartarus uses his manipulation to convince Cashua to ally with the Dark Knights and they head north together. In Almorica, Ronway says that the Dark Knights have agreed to mediate a meeting at Rhyme to make a peace treaty between the Wallister and the Backroom. But the Duke wants the end of the backroom to take control of the island for himself, so he sets a trap. 
Leonor and Ronwe would go to the meeting and kidnap Tartarus, preventing the other Dark Knights from attacking while he was held hostage, and Danum would enter the city hidden by the mountains to the west, finishing off the backroom soldiers and taking control of the city again. At this point they are informed that Galgastani rebels have taken Koratania's castle, but this was also a trap set by Ronwe to gather all the Galgastani rebels in one place. While the day of the meeting in Rhyme does not arrive, Danum is sent to Koratania to kill all the remaining Galgastani rebels. The rebels were led by Zebos Ronsenbach, Balbato's right-hand man, and they held Vice hostage. Danum and his group fight Zebos and defeat him, killing the rest of the rebels. Vice takes advantage of the confusion and escapes, fleeing from there. Danum goes to Rhyme as planned. In Rhyme, Leonar and Ronwe kidnap Balxaphon as Tartarus has not shown up. While Danum defeats all the backroom knights, Ozma manages to invade the place and escape with Balxaphon. Leonar tries to stop them, but Vice appears and puts a knife to Ronwe's throat. Leonar tries to convince him to turn himself in, but Vice kills the Duke and is then killed by the knights. Danum and Leonard return to Almorica to plan their next steps. With the Duke dead, they decide to follow his legacy and wishes and coordinate an all-out attack on Fitta Castle. He also finds Merton and Warren recovering from the Battle of Rhyme. The White Knight joined Danum's group while Warren is still recovering from his wounds. Danum and Leonard split up to attack the mighty castle on two separate fronts. Seeing the army arriving, Balxaphon leaves the castle to Ozma and prepares to leave together with Tartarus. Ozma, who was holding Prancet hostage, seeing his critical health due to torture, decides to release him out of the castle. Prancet wanders lost in the region until he is found by Olivia, one of his friend Ruva's daughters. Olivia hides Prancet and takes him west to tend to his health. Leonar manages to advance first and enters the main hall of the place. There, he encounters Kashua, who attacks, mortally wounding him. Danum enters soon after and sees this scene, realizing that Kashua is now on the side of the Loslorian Dark Knights. She flees along with Tartarus and Balxaphon to Heim while Danum faces Osman in the castle hall. Osman and the Knights of Lodis are defeated and killed. With Leonar's death, Danum takes control and becomes the leader of the Wallister resistance. In Heim, Tartarus spreads the news to the entire island that the lost daughter of King Dorgalua has been found, the true heir to the throne of Valyria, and that Lodi supported her as governess. This information shook all the civilians who wanted peace and the unification of the island under a legitimate ruler with royal blood. Even the warriors of the Wallister resistance were wary of taking up arms against the true heir. A ceremony is held at Hyle to commemorate the princess' return, with Brantum and King Dorgalua's former soldiers offering loyalty and Tartarus, representing Pope Sardian and the Holy Lodician Empire, reaffirming the alliance between the two nations. Tartarus visits the prison where Lands was being tortured and the two discuss their views on the war. Tartarus believes that people cry out for someone to rule them because they are incapable of doing anything and just play victims. Hamilton, on the other hand, had faith in humanity and in the freedom of people to do the right thing. 
Tartarus walks away and leaves the knight who took his eye on Zenobia alone. To face the warriors of the south, Branton decides to go after the forbidden magic apocrypha that King Roderick Dismoria had used in the war against Dorgaliua and had been sealed by Mruva Foina. He decides to send Mruva's own daughter, Sherry, who had betrayed her family, in search of her own father. With the appearance of the princess, some warriors who were devotees of the Order of Philaha revolt against the resistance and take control of Brigantes, taking hostages. Danum decides to go there to talk to them. To prove that he didn't want to fight and saw peace, Danum arrives at the castle without his army and totally unarmed, which gives confidence to the rebels who don't attack him. Danum is then greeted by Olivia, who was commanding the rebels, and says that Prancet, his father, was in the castle. Danum is surprised he is alive and rushes to find him. Prancet was extremely weakened from the poison used in the torture, so he tells Danum the whole story of Cashua and how she was Dorgalua's daughter, Versalia. Prancet says that Lodis was there seeking Dorgalua's power, and as they now had his daughter, they would go after the king's tomb to get his power. He tells him to find Mruva, the order's former superior, who would help him. In his last breath of life, Prancet tells Danum to save his sister and lead Valeria to the right path. Danum sees his father dying in his arms shortly afterwards. After that moment, Olivia asks if Danum doesn't remember her. Olivia reveals that she and her three other sisters played with Danum and Cashua when they were children and lived in Heim. Olivia reveals that Danum is not a Wallister, but a backroom. Her real name was Danum Warren and Branton, the ruler of the backroom, was her uncle. Danum is shocked by the revelation, but also reveals something to Olivia, that one of her sisters, Sistina, were outside the castle with his group. Olivia is reunited with her sister, and they indicate where Mruva, their father, could be. Olivia joins the group, and they head towards their destination. They arrive at the location indicated by the sisters and find Ruva surrounded by backroom troops, with Sherry in the lead and asking where the Apocrypha is. Sistina and Olivia try to convince their sister to give up, but Sherry commands her warriors to face Danum. The protagonist's group defeats all the warriors and Sherry, alone, retreats and flees. Danum asks Mruva for help in ending all wars, uniting the entire island back into one nation, just as Dorgaliua did in the past. Mruva agrees to help, and with that the Order of Philaha allies and supports the resistance. Danum is informed that pirates are attacking merchants nearby, so he decides to go there to help while Mruva goes to Fiddock. On the way, due to a storm, they need to retreat to some shelter. They notice a figure hiding in one of the houses. It was Sherry, who was devastated that she had been unable to carry out her orders. 
Danum says his goal is just to bring peace to the island, and Sistina and Olivia manage to convince their sister to join the resistance. They arrive at the marked location and find some pirates commanded by Merrick Elrig. Merrick says it's a mistake, as they weren't pirates, but what was left of the Liberation Front. Danum was suspicious, as all the members of the group had been killed in the massacre. Merrick explains that they were saved by being on the high seas at the moment, and that there was someone there he could talk to. They find Saria again, and now no longer at the Duke's command and acting like a true hero, she decides to join Danum, along with Captain Merrick. To prepare for the invasion of Heim and confront Brenton and Tartarus, Danum looks for a way to raise funds for the war and his army. His informants comment on an alleged treasure hidden by pirates on an island to the south, and he decides to head there to find it. The informant warns to be careful as there are reports of people disappearing there due to a witch taking them to the depths. Danum and his group head to Port Omish, a neutral region where bandits and pirates used to stay and which was now also home to main island civilians and refugees fleeing the war. Among these people, a person with wings sang and admired everyone with his voice. Canopus soon recognizes her. It was her sister, Ayuria Wolf. Surprised with her being there, he tries to get her attention, but when noticed, Ayuria flees towards the caves. In town, they meet Diego Gale at Azelston, the famous and feared pirate who people say was the only one able to reach the depths of the pirate graveyard and come back alive. Diego had left behind his life of pillaging as soon as his daughter died in battle during the war and this led to a life of frustration and drinking. Danum convinces him to join the rebels to end the war once and for all. Diego accepts and guides them inside the pirate graveyard. Inside, they are reunited with Ayuria, who reveals herself to be a sea witch who had possessed Canopus sister's body and would steal their souls as well. Danum confronts the witch and manages to defeat her, expelling her from her body and bringing the real Ayuria back. Ayuria explains that she was there looking for her brother after learning of the exile and that the witch had saved her from pirates during the trip. Ayuria joins the group and they continue deeper into the caves, where they eventually find the said treasure of legends. Now with the necessary funds for the war, they return and head to Fiddick to prepare the attack to the north. Hearing the sound of many gold coins that were now with the group, the Zenobian Deneb Rove appears and offers its powerful and exclusive equipment for sale to the Resistance. Knowing that the battle against Brenton and the Dark Knights would be very difficult, Danum decides to spend a large amount on equipment and weapons. Deneb's magical servants who helped at the shop see all the wealth and revolt at not being paid for their work, starting a revolution. Danum helps Deneb negotiate a deal for them to run the store and receive a share of the profits in return, pacifying the situation. Deneb joins Danan's group to seek out more artifacts and knowledge while her servants work in the shop in her place. On the way to Fiddock, they pass Almorica and Danum finds that Warren has improved a little and is awake. He asks the Astromancer the real reason the Zenobians were on the island, if it was to dominate just like Lodi's. 
Warren explains that they were after the Brynhildr sword that had been stolen from Zenobia by the Dark Knights, as this sword was very dangerous in the wrong hands as it could break any seal, including those in Chaos Gates. Deneb says hi to his companion in Zenobia and wishes him a speedy recovery. Dana hurries up and heads for Fiddick. On Fiddick, the Resistance prepares their army to march on Heim, but Danum is informed by one of the spies that Kashua has been seen heading north to Barnisha along with Tartarus. Danum then decides to send some troops towards Heim as a distraction to the backroom while he and his group headed towards Barnisha. On the way to Barnisha, the Dark Knight Endoras appears and stands in the way. The two armies clash, and seeing defeat imminent, Andorras retreats and flees. At the gates of Barnisha, they are met by the Dark Knight Barbus and his Knights of Lodis, causing a conflict with many casualties on each side, but with victory tending towards resistance. Barbus withdraws from the battle and flees. Inside the castle, Tartarus orders Kashua to flee to Heim, but she refuses, saying she can't take any more wars and fights and goes into hiding. Tartarus tries to go after her, but at that moment Danum and his army appear in the main hall of the castle. Tartarus and Danum face off while the other warriors in the group battle the Lodi soldiers accompanying the commander. The fight goes on for a long time due to the Death Templar's extreme strength and skill, but seeing that he was outnumbered, Tartarus retreats and flees. Inside the castle, Danum finds Kashua sad and scared in one of the rooms. Kashua says that she was very disappointed to have been abandoned by Danum and that she couldn't take the whole situation anymore. Danum admits that his actions eventually led him to abandon his sister. Kashua says that will no longer be a burden, pulling the knife and taking her own life. Danum screams in despair as he holds his sister's lifeless body. With the mission failing, he returns to Fiddick. Danum apologizes to the rest of the resistance for being unable to save the princess's life. He decides to command the troops against the Dark Knights and Branton in revenge for his sister's death. The Resistance spreads news across the island that it was Lodis who killed the princess, a claim the Dark Knights deny. Danum remembers his sister Kashua, how he could have prevented her from dying if he had cared more about her. Despite this, he prepares his equipment and his armies and marches towards Heim. Resistance armies and backroom armies clash on the battlefield on multiple fronts for several days. Danum receives information that a ship that was passing near the Valyrian Islands ended up sinking nearby and the survivors were being attacked. Danum goes there to help and finds the Dark Knight Martin preparing to kill the last survivor, the Fusilier Jonathan Torjo's Lindel. Martin is relentless and with his powerful blows takes the lives of many soldiers in Danum's group before retreating and fleeing. Jonathan joins the group in gratitude for Danum saving his life. On the way to Heim, he encounters Gant and his two beasts again, initiating another clash. 
Gimp is defeated for the third time and asks Danum to take his life but spare the lives of his two pets. Danum notices Gamp's good heart and invites him to join the group to use his talents for good. Gamp, Berta, and Abda begin to be part of the resistance at this time. In Heim, Brenton and Tartarus argue around the other Dark Knights. Tartarus says he will return to Lodi's because Brenton was already doomed from the beginning for refusing to follow his orders not to invade and now for not returning command of the kingdom to the crown princess as the population wanted. At that moment, Barbus, Martim and Andorra's rebel and point their weapons at Tartarus, Balxaphon and Valak, trapping them in a room. Martim takes the Brynhild sword that was with them and accuses Tartarus of wanting Dorgalua's power just for himself, making up this story that he would need the princess and not going directly to the Chaos Gate as Lodi's orders. Barbus, Martim and Andorus head towards the Hanging Gardens to get the power for them. Tartarus, Balxaphon, and Volok manage to break free from prison and flee the castle just as Danum troops arrive in Heim. Danum orders Branton to surrender and leave the Regency, but he refuses and commands his knights to fight. Danum defeats his uncle, thus ending the Bakram Valerian Kingdom. Not having time to celebrate, they are informed that the Dark Knights are heading to the Hanging Gardens. Danum remembers his father's words and decides to stop them from reaching Dorgalua's power. While still in Heim, they discover a man trapped in the dungeon. It was Lance Hamilton, the Zenobia Knight who had been tortured to the point of being catatonic and memoryless due to the trauma. Hamilton is left in care as they make their way to the gardens. Within the many floors of the abandoned gardens, Danum encounters many creatures and beasts. He advances and finds Andorras and her knights guarding the path leading to the Chaos Gate. They engage in combat and Andorras is defeated and killed. Danum and his group rush towards the chamber, but it was too late. Barbus had already used the sword Brynhild to break the seal on the gate. They face each other as the Chaos Gate starts to activate. Barbus and Martim are finally defeated and killed. Danum takes the legendary sword and at that moment, coming from the abyss, King Dorgalua Abarith appears, completely corrupted by darkness, transformed into an ogre due to all the time he spent in the underworld. Driven by hatred, Dorgalua says that he will return to reign over the island that is rightfully his and kill all his opponents. The former king uses his newfound powers of the abyss to create cursed clones of all the warriors in Danum's group, sparking a fierce battle between them. Danum manages to organize his army to face the creatures and delivers the killing blow to Dorgalua.
The evil god of the underworld Demunza then uses his powers to further corrupt Dorgalua in order to bring on another ogre battle and rule the world. Dorgalua transforms into a gigantic creature and starts attacking the protagonists. With the union of the entire army, they manage to injure the beast and Danum manages to deliver the deadly attack on the creature. The creature rises, slamming into the walls and destroying the pillars of the room as it disintegrates and is pulled back into the abyss. The room starts to collapse and the chaos gate starts pulling everyone into the underworld. At that moment Warren appears still weakened and uses the rest of his powers to teleport everyone out of the hanging gardens. With no more energy, Warren is drawn into the chaos gate, which is destroyed shortly after by the room collapsing. Epilogue With the defeat of Branton and the Lothlorian Dark Knights, preparations begin for Danum coronation as king, uniting all Valyria again under his command. Danum finds Merton and Canopus in Heim and gives them the Brynhildr sword to take back to their homeland. With Warren gone and Lance Hamilton disabled, the two remaining Zenobians and Iuria take the ship to Zenobia. Deneb, seeing the end of the war is not good for his business, hitches a ride with them to the east. Meanwhile, to the north, the three surviving Lothlorian Dark Knights, Tartarus, Balxaphon, and Volok, hide inside a ship that was heading towards Lodis and escape undiscovered. Don Alto Presence returns to Almorica to care for the war orphans, in the hope that someday the hatred between the people of the island will end. Folkert, Bayan, and Aracel return together to their homelands. Falkert and Bayan plan to set up an academy and teach at it. Hoberim decides to return to Lodis to seek revenge on his brother Balxaphon. Diego Gala de Zelston dies in his bed of an unknown illness, asking to be buried in the sea. Elias returns to her hometown to take care of her brother Devold and live in peace. The rest of the group stays in Heim as King Danum Army. The coronation ceremony takes place. King Danamorn unifies the peoples again under her command with the complete acceptance of the island's population, bringing peace to Valyria once more. Not long after, Lodi sends an army of 200,000 men to invade Valyria for not accepting Danum as the island's rightful ruler and another battle begins. This is the end of the story of the game Tactics Ogre. Let us cling together. What did you think of this game when you first played it? Are you ready for Reborn? Write in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, give a like and subscribe to the channel. It helps us a lot here on YouTube. Thank you all and see you soon with more videos from the Ogre Battle Saga.